Good evening. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing? Welcome to the George and Joyce Ween Jazz and Heritage Center. My name is Kia Robinson Hatfield, and I'm the Director of Programs and Marketing here at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, the producer of Sync Up, and the owner of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. Our role with the festival is to take the money that is earned and to put that directly back into Louisiana communities. And we do that through economic development, cultural enrichment, and education. This building that you're in right now houses our free music education program in which we educate kids weekly in music education. It's also where we have our concerts and other events that happen. Uh, so welcome, we're glad to see you here tonight. This is the second uh, sync up session in a three part series in which we're calling NOLA Next, uh, which focuses on artists emerging, collaborating, and evolving all within the New Orleans music economy. The last session in this series is next week on October 27th, uh, and the subject of that session will be entrepreneurial collaboration. And we'll be in discussions with Raj Smooth uh, and Lou Hill of Genrise with 3D Nati and other special guests. So uh, if you wanna come to that, tune in online or come right back here to this building, that's gonna be a dope discussion. So speaking of collaborations, I am so thankful to the Recording Academy for being our partners in sync up for many, many years. And I'd like to bring up one special person who has been uh, a true soldier in helping us to curate sync up over the years, Recording Academy Representative Lee Wick. I was all the way at the back. <laughs> Thank you, Kia. And um, as Kia mentioned, my name is Reed Wick. I'm in the membership and industry relations department at the Recording Academy, which is the Grammy organization. And we share very much a similar mission of education and, and community enrichment and things like that with the Jazz and Heritage Foundation. So it, it makes perfect sense that we've uh, been a longtime sponsor of Sync Up. And I'm really honored that Don and Jason and Kia and the crew uh, invite me into their planning meetings and we have some really cool brainstorming sessions on how we can serve the community and I was really thrilled when we all kind of thought the same thing that this next generation emerging artist kind of theme for these three sync up uh, panels uh, came to fruition and really uh, I think we couldn't have done better. Last week with Mia X, this week what you're gonna hear with Pal and Nate and the global warming, and as Kia just mentioned, next week is gonna be fantastic as well. So, I don't wanna to talk too much, I wanna bring out the guests, but thank you, and uh, let's hear some good stuff. Thank you, Reed. All right, so tonight we're discussing collaborating as emerging artists, and who better to lead that discussion other than a music journalist and our moderator tonight. She is a founding partner at Jazz Carl Productions, a live event and digital media company. She's co-founder of the Gentili Agency, and she recently launched her own independent PR and creative strategy company. Please welcome Amanda Mester. Uh, Amanda Mester. Global warming is a collective of New Orleans creatives ranging from, but not limited, limited to, songwriters, lawyers, producers, engineers, uh, performing artists, artists, managers, and so much more. They are changing the climate for how New Orleans music industry is being conducted. Uh, and we are gonna talk about all of that and more tonight. So please welcome the global warming team, Pell, Nate Cameron, Chad Roby, and Juan Nett. Hello, can y'all hear me all right? What's up everybody? Thanks for coming. Uh, show of hands, how many of y'all have listened to the Global Warming Record? Okay, all right. For those of you who may not have listened to it, 
by the end of today. You'll yeah. play it a few times. <laughs> My name is Amanda Mester. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Um, and we're going to talk today a little bit about collaboration as an idea, collaboration as practice, uh, and hopefully get into some advice about how emerging artists can incorporate collaboration into their work. Um, so let's get started. Uh, how about y'all go one by one and introduce yourselves and what your roles are? Sure. My name is Hank Cameron, uh, New Orleans native. I started out as an artist and I went to school to do the business, so I'm involved in the business side of the game. Uh, one of the co founders of Blue One, also worked in the management team of the Tank and Bangers, and uh, also on the board of the Youth and Cultural Coalition of New Orleans. So I do a lot to advocate for artists and uh, just allow artists to have their voice. So that's kind of what led me to creating this uh, collective with these dope guys. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Juan Yusuf. Um, also a New Orleans native. Um, I, I do like some, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer by trade, but I do um, management, A&R. Um, I work with a lot of artists in the city, particularly in like the hip hop and R&B genres. I try to expand to everybody, though. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Global Warming, and uh, it's just it's very nice to be here. Fire. Um, my name is Pell, and uh, Jared Pell, Pellerin. Um, I'm a New Orleans native as well. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Global Warming. I'm also a creative uh, director, <laughs> creative director, entrepreneur, uh, producer, engineer, if you need it, um, and multiple hats. Uh, but I work with a lot of artists in the city just on a more personal level to help connect the dots. So I guess my last title would be a connector um, and, you know, the plug. So yeah, that's it. Hi, uh, my name's Chad Roby. I'm also a New Orleans native. I'm an Upbeat Academy alum, 2015. So I see a couple of y'all in here. Um, I went to SCAD in 2015, graduated 2019. And I studied sound design, came back home, and I opened up my own uh, recording studio, Cloud Studios. So I met these, these folks, for the most part. But crew was uh, two doors down. And then from there, we just kept linking. And then that's kind of the story. Yeah. My name is Crucial. I'm an artist, producer, engineer from New Orleans. Uh, studio owner as well, collaborator, creative, extraordinaire, <laughs> and pizza eater, you know? Pizza so why don't you all get into a little bit of the origin story um, of global warming as an idea. I'll give this to Pell and or Nate. Cool, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can go back and forth on this. Um, I, so the inception of global warming, I feel like was more of an idea in 2017, 2018, when, um, you know, I think crew had a stew in off of Tulane and a couple other homies had studios in various places around the studio, uh, the city, and it made sense for us to collaborate, but a lot of the records that we were making didn't really leave the studio, and I felt like there was a need for us to kind of take these rap records and not only perform them, but like break bread with one another, do business with one another in a way that, you know, when we leave New Orleans, if we go to LA, go to New York, go to Atlanta, um, we have something, a calling card for all of us, you know what I mean, that we put out something together and we actually put it, something behind it, some money behind it, uh, some type of business acumen behind it so that people could see what we're doing, you know, in the city. And uh, I remember one of the first times I ever had a conversation with somebody about it was uh, Malik95, who is not present, um, who is also a part of Global Warming, uh, him and I were actually in Los Angeles in a session, and we were like, yeah, we're going to call it global warming because it's, it's heating up, you know, city heating up. And uh, we kind of deaded it uh, after that year because I was in 2017. And a couple years went by, and I met Nate Cameron while uh, opening up for the Tank and the Bangers. And uh, I, I actually looked at uh, some of the texts uh, that we had before, and it was just crazy because we hit it off from, from the jump 
just talking about everything that the city needed in terms of infrastructure, you know, with us being a well of talent and us always getting poached and people having to go to LA, New York, and not really focusing on the, you know, economy down here, um, how much it was needed. And we knew a lot of the same people and a lot of the same artists that wanted the same thing. So, uh, you know, that's when, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Um, we started working, I think, mo way more intensely on getting a project together um, first, so. Yeah, and I, be, I mean, just to kind of pick up where you left off at, I mean, Pell's kind of more so was the creative side. And I mean, I, I, I sing, I write, I produce still, that's just not the main thing that I do, but that's how I met Tank and the Bangers is because we originally had a group called the Liberated Soul Collective before it was Tank and the Bangers. And so, but I went to school at Tennessee State for music business, which is in Nashville. And if you don't know about Nashville, I learned very quickly Nashville is a music business hub. And coming from New Orleans, I knew all about performing. I knew all about, you know, all these things in front of the camera, but I had no idea about publishing. I had no idea about licensing and singing. So that's what opened my eyes. And so the business world is really what kind of took me in the business side because I really got intrigued with how money was generated. I was blessed to meet some people who were doing some things in Nashville that took me under their wing. And so my thought was like, how can I bring this back home. Like we have a wealth of talent. I mean, I know I'm biased, but I just feel like I've traveled a lot of different places specifically to hear and play music. And like, we have unmatched talent, like nowhere else. And so I'm just trying to figure out how can I bring back some of these things that I've learned from these major corporations that have been doing this on a big level. How can I bring that back? And so, you know, meeting Pell at that time when we were on tour, I mean, it, it, it just kind of aligned at the right time because he was wanting to do the same thing. Our brother, who's a producer, who is no longer with us, Nayo Da Vinci. Nayo also, and this just also kind of goes to show you about why spaces and safe spaces and just spaces to create are important because Nayo and I, you know, we've known each other, but we got connected a little bit more when I had a studio in Fountain Blue, which is the same building that Chad's studio is in, the same building. Crucial helped me to get my studio in that building. I mean, so like, that is, so there's something about like just having a space to like create synergy and why stuff like that is important because a lot of us wouldn't even know each other had that space not been there. We didn't, you know, feel safe to create that. And so, yeah, I think that was just my thing was, look, let's make sure, yes, we get a project out. Let's make sure the music is good. That's easy. But let's also make sure that we have some of the managers that are doing things in town, some of the people like Juan, some of the some of the legal people, some of the people that are A&Rs that are interested in seeing the scene grow. I feel like there's always been a disconnect. There's been a bunch of artists in the past that have gotten together and wanted to see things go, but there's always been like that infrastructure or admin disconnect. So that was just my intentionality. Like as much as we want to focus on the music, let's also focus on the business side, the marketing. Let's make sure that there's sustainability with this. Like how are we teaching our artists how to monetize, you know, your stuff beyond just streaming, you know, because we know that's coins on a dollar. But uh, yeah, that's 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 kind of my you know feel into it. And it's you know for those that don't know, the collective is, I mean, you know, really loosely probably about. 17 different artists and probably about eight different producers and ever growing like it's not even like I would say an official roster because it's really just an affiliate of like a bunch of different people who we all work with and vibe with and so we're just we just wanted to have something that can be official and like a calling court of sorts and show people that New Orleans can come together and do this and so let's open up some other avenues of business. You know? So can you tell us a little bit about um, how you approached making collaboration kind of a bedrock of global warming. I mean, obviously, with the folks on stage here um, and all the others that you just mentioned, it's it's proof that um, global warming as an idea and collaboration as a business practice, as a creative practice, are inextricable. But how did you um, approach that idea that sh that you two had uh, and bring it to the group? And what what was the conversation? And and how intentional were you with focusing on collaboration? Yeah. Uh I think we were really <laughs> focused on collab <laughs> Hey, guys. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Um, no, no, no. I think we were really focused on collaboration from the jump. So I think it was already there. Um, a lot of the artists that are a part of Volume 1 um, already had worked together. So it wasn't too much going outside of our network to find anybody to work with us. So that was already, that made it way easier. And especially talking about how far this dates back. Um, think about you know, 2018, there were songs that we were working on too that, you know, um, 
kind of showed themselves in, in different ways in the, in the newest version of the project. And I think that also because of that, because we had things that we had worked on so long ago, um, other people were aware of the project that was being made. So I think um, while in 2019 and 2020 it, it kicked into hyperdrive in terms of how much we were, how much content, or not content, how much art we were making, um, got to make that distinction. Um, I just got back from LA, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but um, so like how much, how much art we were making at that time, I think we, we didn't have anywhere to funnel it. And I think once uh, quarantine started last year, I think everybody was able to sit down and everybody was really, we were trading a lot of songs that we were just making for ourselves that we didn't know where it was going or you know if we were gonna pitch it, if we were gonna um, give it to our homie or whatnot, or we, it was just gonna sit on our laptop. And a lot of that started um, the collaborative process of like, oh, this is what it sounds like when we work together. And I think once we realized what that sounded like, it made it easy for us to know what felt right to share with one another outside of our, our own projects. Like, I think high, um, like we, we have so many that, uh, me and Crucial have so many that like I feel like show themselves in the newest version of the project. And um, a lot of other artists that I worked with and that we've all worked with came, in, came out of the woodwork and I think uh, we, w we did a lot at your studio, which was crazy. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I guess in the second yeah. half of the, like, you know, I guess production of the project, a lot of the work, I, like, treated my studio as a creative space where people can, like, meet up and uh, link, commune, because that's kind of how I, how I see the studio. It's a place where you can make connections and connect through art, and, you know, that's how you get to know people a little bit better. So that was my approach with, um, you know, or I guess my intent with like having people come through and inviting people. I really didn't know if these records were gonna be on the Global Warming Project itself. You know, I think most of the time as creatives, we just make make a bunch of stuff and then, you know, figure it out in the back end, you know, see what works together. And I feel like that's kind of how uh, a lot of the records were made. Uh, Hi When I'm Around You, uh, that's, that, was like, that was a good session. We had uh, Iceberg come through. Me, you, Malik, 95, uh, who else was there? Day, oh, Daylight. Daylight was there. Uh, Dom, Dom was there, Dominic Scott, uh, Daylight Rodriguez. Uh, and yeah, just everybody was just kind of like riffing out ideas, singing different melodies. And I think Malik had a drum pattern and then that was like the start of the song, you know? So all of the sessions kind of didn't have a, we're gonna make this type of record. It was just like, we're making something, hopefully it's good, and it usually is, so, yeah. Can you talk a little bit, Chad, about um, the role that collaboration plays specifically for someone who's a producer, as opposed to someone who might be a vocalist or an MC, and just the nature of your, your job, basically, to collaborate with any anyone who might want to be interested in working with you. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I, I guess I didn't say this either. I'm a producer and an engineer, <laughs> so thank you for that. You're welcome. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm rare because I don't like working with a lot of other producers. It's like not what I enjoy doing. I think I had like usually it's a friendship thing first. We have to vibe as people before I can even like get to work with you. But I think it is when I have collaborated with producers, that's when I've learned the most. You know, uh, Charlie, you know, uh, Wana Willie, you know, Frank Carrick, these are like both two producers who are here in the audience that like, you know, I guess iron sharpens iron, you know, uh, and that's what I think, if you're around the right producers, you know, it can always be a better experience to work with those people, but you just gotta find your tribe, you know, so. And Crucial, Crucial is the, uh, one of the voices, if not the most uh, well-known voice now on Global Warming Song 504, which is, arguably the breakout hit, um, became kind of anthemic for the city. You guys did it at what, with a plate at Pelicans game, Saints game, right? All kinds of stuff, NAACP oh, Image Awards, oh, all that. Oh, oh. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about uh, your role in the creative process and the collaborative process for that record specifically? Uh, at the time we started working on it because I had a studio of my own not far from 40 and I was still communicating with Pell almost every day, pre and during the pandemic, we were working on different ideas and songs all the time. I'm like another session we did was the uh, party session. Right after we finished 504, 
at Axiom Art Gallery on Ferret Street, Co Studio. We did Party in the Back with me, uh, who was on the Pell, Sleeves, Kenny Brother. That's like it. Trey, Trey Pound, Trey Pound, Trey Pound Malik. 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 Yeah, that, they put that beat together super fast. And then everybody <laughs> knocked their verses out super fast. So it's dope to watch it from a production standpoint. Uh, another song, Well Shit. I produced that at like two o'clock in the morning. Sent it to Pell, who I was on FaceTime with, and he sent it back within like an hour. And we were still <laughs> on FaceTime. That's, that's the crazy part about it. So we're like making songs across the country in real time. And I don't think we had a direct idea of what we were gonna do with the song when we made it. We were just creating because that's what we do. You know, that's how we build the ideas and get them out of our heads and turn them into different things. And I think part of what we had, like Pell was saying, we didn't have to reach outside of the relationships we had because of the network being how we have it. So it's like being able to make something valuable from the relationships you have, that's, that's different, that's magic, that's alchemy. You know, that's something <laughs> special. Uh, I was gonna say too, like there are different parts of the production process when collaboration is just bound to happen. Like once you start engineering a record or like fully producing it, cause like first, you know, a producer might make a beat then the artist might lay vocals, and then you'll do like additional production after that. That's when you can do a lot of the, you know, I guess we're gonna get this person in to play keys, or the, you know, that's when a lot of the, I guess, additional collaboration happens. I feel like that's when the song like really can come to life. So that's that's the part of the production process I love collaborating on. So, yeah. And what's the part you don't like? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> don't go on there. Don't, don't go there. No, I, shout out to Chad because. Over the, <laughs> over the course of this whole process, um, there were verses, uh, sounds, <laughs> um, you know, everything, ad libs, voice, voice memo recordings on people's phones that now are beautiful interludes. Um, <laughs> that like, for real though, it's crazy that like, this man mixed together and mastered together so that it was a cohesive part of the project. I think we all, had an idea of what was going on, like in terms of like what we were creating and myself included, like I'm like, oh yeah, I'm executively producing and like all this in my head in terms of like top to bottom track listing, but the way that everything sonically went together um, in, in the way that you hear it now is because of this man. And it's, it's what's, what's the, what's, what, can I hear a horror story? What, like give me, uh, horror story. Uh, on camera. I guess, uh, okay, so for party, so, like, like Crew said, we recorded that in the back of Axiom Art Gallery. I mean, it's a, Co has a studio for sure. He does have a studio in the back. And like, if it was one person in the in, we in, there, in the booth, oh, we were in the booth. It's in a room full of people. Right. So yeah, it's a room full of people. A bunch of background chatter, people talking, having normal conversations. I can hear all that in the mic. You know, just trying to make those things work. There's some like, I guess, ivory. I think Jizzle's verse had like a little plosive that I was like, wow, it's gonna have to be in there. But there's a whole bunch of small stuff that are like, you know, happy accidents. You try to control them, but like, you just make it work. There's some stuff you gotta just let go. And then you know, you, got, you have to know when to let go as well. But it is stressful as heck, <laughs> as heck. Juan, you hear that pain in the music. Yeah. Juan, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the infrastructure element, the business element of global warming as a collective and, and what you brought to the table as far as kind of helping to construct some of the infrastructure around the music? Um, yeah, that was that was essentially my, my role in the whole thing. Um, I was watching from the outside as like all my friends have been collaborating over the years. Like Pella tell you, me and him have been going to the studio together since like what, 2014, 2015 when I first got out of college and like came to 2013, man. For real, like I, like we, we used to go and watch 0017 collaborate. Like I've seen like all the guys from the Magnolia collaborate. Like I've been around a lot of different, you know, organizations and people who were loosely trying to do, I guess what we did, but it, it didn't work out in the same way. So seeing that I always wanted to put together some sort of way to educate the artists. Cause artists, like contrary to popular belief, artists don't really have a problem coming together and creating the issue becomes into like, you know, ownership and how do you split percentages and how do you get royalties and what does publishing mean and all of that. And my thought has always been the more educated an artist is, the, the better an artist is, just period. 
and it's not doesn't mean you have to be as educated as a music executive, but you have to know the basic things about how you're making money. Because at the end of the day, like if you're gonna treat it like a career and not a hobby, you have to know where your money's coming from and how you're generating it and how you know to value yourself in a monetary like standpoint. Like I get it, it's it's art, it's very emotional, it's very sentimental. But at the end of the day, if you want to do it as a career, you have to be able to quantify it and understand it in those ways. So my real goal in my role in Global Warming was to not only have everybody come together and make this music and, you know, get it out there, but as we got it out there, you know, give everybody a contract, just a standard contract that explains what you did, exactly how much you're gonna have, like, everybody had equal splits on everything, everybody understood, like, people who had never seen a split sheet in their lives now understand, you know, what a split sheet looks like, what a, if they're a producer, what a producer agreement looks like versus a side artist agreement if they were an artist, like, and it's very simple, like people who didn't have BMIs, we got them signed up for BMI and ASCAP, depending on what they wanted to do, so they could, you know, understand you can get mailbox money, even if it's just a little bit, you gotta start out with the account. If you don't have an account, you can't register nothing to it, you know? So that's that's really what we tried to do is, what, and Nate, Nate was definitely instrumental in all of that as well, trust me, because whenever anybody had a question and they hit Nate, Nate immediately called me and I, we both made sure, and if we didn't know, we called somebody else, but, um, that was, that was really, I, I feel like our dual purpose in it was not only proving that it's a myth that, you know, New Orleans artists don't collaborate, but educating us so that, you know, when we do go on and have these great successes that everybody is better for it, nobody signs, you know, some crazy deal because they didn't know what was going on, so. Yeah. Nate, can you um, give those of us who may not be totally familiar a little um, history of collaboration as an idea specifically in New Orleans and maybe specifically in hip hop and why it may have been really important to, like Juan just said, um, expel that myth? I think because it's just like you said, it's it's happened before and we've seen it before and I grew up in an era where, you know, obviously there was cash money and no limit, but there was also Take Four Records, uh, Full Pack, uh, Cycle Ward. People were doing it, but I didn't really see anybody do it to a level of how I saw people in New York and taking it to Def Jam and these major conglomerations. You know, there was always some kind of ceiling. Sometimes those ceilings were very systematic because education, you know, people didn't know how to monetize themselves, right? Sometimes there were barriers that these guys were going to jail and, you know, there was these other, you know, these things going on, right? And so, I don't know, I just, I just was really, and, and these guys too are also being very modest in a sense. New Orleans is a unique place. Like, everybody does a lot of different things. We not only have artists, but we have a lot of artists who do a lot of different things. All these guys perform, mix, engineer, you know, they know some of the business side of things. And so like, I think that's something that we just wanted to try to highlight, that it's okay to know how to do all these different kind of things, but it's, and it's okay to come together, but let's also monetize it and not be exploited. Because in the past, I think that from jazz to rap to instrumental to Zydeco, I mean, the story's going to funk. You know, we can name groups for days that have been exploited, and at the root of most of that was just people didn't know. You know, I meet some of these, not, not calling nobody's names, but I meet some of these old heads who have records that have been sampled in hits after hits after hits, and, you know, they'll say, man, I just didn't know. I was just playing music back then. I didn't know that I was supposed to make this amount of money every time this song was played. I was just a young cat trying to see the world, trying to play music. And I think, you know, you know, we, we are very welcoming people. We're very naive, you know, creative, free people, and that's been exploited. And so it's just kind of like, it's time to, you know. And I think also, we, that's a whole nother conversation about how the culture of New Orleans is sometimes, you know, bent and picked and, you know, kind of picked and chosen and, you know, brought to other places and made bigger. It's just because people just didn't know. And so I think to protect our culture in general, we have to, know about the history of it and educate yourselves because you got to be able to go against what's coming at you, but you got to know what's happening. But the, the history of it all, I mean, New Orleans, we can go deep. Like, I'm a music nerd. I mean, New Orleans and just the history of music in New Orleans is just so collaborative. It, 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 I mean, from jazz to Congo Square to take it back, there, I mean, it, 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 it was never a singular thing. It was always something that was communal. And so I just think now it's just the manifestation of that. I mean, now it's hip hop and R&B, electronic and everything else that's going on. It's just a different iteration of it, but 
Yeah, man. I mean, we we're a special place, and we deserve to we deserve to have that. You know, we deserve to have an ecosystem where there are different groups of people. And that's another thing too. New Orleans is a small place, but I think that it's unique in a sense that different groups and different ecosystems can live and thrive in it and work with with each other when they need to. Everybody doesn't have to listen to the same thing. Everybody doesn't like the same. Thing. I think that was one thing that you know really I prided you know on working with the Global Warming Project is that it just the biggest thing I got back was that's not, it's New Orleans, but it's not typical New Orleans. Like, I like that. Like, I could tell it's New Orleans, but I didn't hear a lot of the key things that are commercially thrown to me that are supposed to be New Orleans music. And that was exactly what a lot of these artists are doing individually anyway. And so, so yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we have to know history, but I mean, it's up to us to like put our foot down and like change the direction of it if we see it going some crazy way, which it kind of was. <laughs> So um, speaking of infrastructure, that's a common theme as well. Um, can we talk a little bit, you mentioned you were in LA earlier. I know that you guys spend a lot of time out there. I know you got, all of you guys spend a lot of time in other cities. Uh, you mentioned Nashville earlier. Um, what are the things that are missing? What are the gaps that exist in the New Orleans music infrastructure that no matter how good you are at collaborating, no matter how talented you are, you're gonna find uh, maybe an obstacle that you might not find in another city. Ooh, I, I think personally from, wait, you, okay, okay. Uh, I think personally from my experience, I've had a lot of good um, experience with syndicating my music and, you know, getting my music placed and like, that's really my breadwinner in, in a lot of times and especially during the pandemic, you know, I had a, a song on Tom and Jerry, um, the movie that came out, Bad Trip, Eric Andre, two Apple commercials, and some other things, and all of this happened, you know, with connections that I've made over, you know, the course of my career. But in New Orleans, I think that there's uh, a need for that pipeline where all these movies, you know, that are filmed here and all these, you know, studios that come down here to kind of, you know, take advantage of the culture and also uh, showcase how beautiful New Orleans is, I think, need to take it into account uh, the musicians that also help, you know, make that culture real. And I think there's there's a need for that direct pipeline so that when, when we do go in these studios, anything that we're not making that's not going to be released on a DSP or for streaming, um, I think that we need to put in a catalog and we need to have these catalogs that can also help um, a publishing company emerge or publishing companies within the city so that that way, you know, we have things that we can give to these businesses and film and television, you know, uh, in a way that feeds us and we don't have to go to LA to make that connection with, because there's only a few of them. There's not that many people that are in, in that game, I feel like, in terms of sink houses. I think you, you establish those relationships and the goal is to bring them down here when people film so that we can have something to, you know, create an infrastructure around. I think that that's one thing that I really think we need here. Anybody else? I think a lot of what I hear, especially from a younger, and I'm speaking from some of my younger like uh, folks and artists that I deal with, a lot that I hear is like, we don't have as many or any, you know, big homies, or we don't have like the artists that made it and then came back and like grabbed folks. I mean, I'm 37, and so like I can remember you know, Lil Wayne and the Squad was probably the biggest collective of my growing up, you know, as far as an organic collective. Obviously, Lil, Lil Wayne was a huge artist, and he had this collective of younger, under-known artists that he knew and worked with that were mostly his friends that he hung with anyway and were always coming on tour with him and hanging around him anyway, so he just made them rap and turned them into a group. So I guess, like, seeing that and really, like, that was inspiring to see, like, people come from where I come from you know, I think you have to see it to be it is what I was always told. Like, to, so to see people come from the same areas and the same hoods that I came from and face the same barriers and kind of press out. And then, I mean, the, the, the squad, I don't know if y'all know, like the squad became a huge, that was one of the most talked about hip hop groups of that time. And they grew just from kind of collectively doing stuff. So a lot of the younger folks feel like we don't have that now. We don't have a guy from New Orleans who made it and put people on. We don't have like that bigger name or some of the bigger names you know, some, some people feel like the bigger names have to move, and I understand that, because some of those bigger names, I know personally, and they feel like once you get to a certain level of 
bigger name, I, I can't be in the same areas anymore. Or I have to go. And so I think a lot of that, and, and for all personal reasons, I mean, people have to do what they have to do. But I think that, you know, there was just like this sense of like making it was equated with leaving New Orleans or like, you know, making it was equivalent to having a lawyer and a big manager in New York and LA, which is cool and that's fine and there was still a need for that, but I think that that became so much of a thing that, you know, there was never infrastructure here built here to where there were places here that we could go and turn in a record and somebody could help get that record to the next level. Like there was never that, so people didn't search for us. So people, you know, we externally searched for that. And so, so much so that it just never got processed. And so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, now is the time. Like, I mean, our, you know, we didn't have these gifts and we didn't meet each other, you know, at this time for no reason. So I'm like, you know, now is the time for us to, quote unquote, buck the system, you know, and like lay our foot down and say, this is how we want to see it done and then just do it, you know, so. So would you say that there have been some demonstrable um, tangible successes that have been reached with this global warming project and the idea and the collective that um, you can attribute directly to the fact that you guys collaborated in the first place? If Hell's Game, Saints Game, I think 504 has definitely shown, um, uh, I casted a light upon, you know, Crucial, Sleeves, myself, and um, RIP Nio. Um, everybody a part of that record as well as just the, the way that people approach business, I think, within the group. We all communicated before on music, but now people are hitting each other up for, well, what does this publishing split, split look like? What is this, you know, um, <laughs> what does this mean if this company wants me to le lease them or, you know, uh, license them my song for a commercial? And uh, I, I'm glad that a lot of those conversations are happening because you're seeing more opportunities happen for artists within because we're now a asking these questions, you know. I guess to piggyback on that, like having those conversations more, <laughs> sorry, having those conversations more also makes it less weird because I feel like in New Orleans, a lot of times you'll like, if any money is brought up or any business is brought up, it's like, why are you trying to play on me? Why are you trying to do whoopty whoop? Like, why are you trying to, like snake me in a way, and and it's not that all that, it's not that, I mean, sometimes that can't happen, but like just having those conversations and making them more of a regular thing, like it, it promotes good business, you know what I mean? And it makes it like, you know, just it makes it regular, you know, so. Speaking of conversations, Chad, like my favorite thing about Global Woman is that it, it got rid of that same old conversation I was tired of having, which was, why don't we work together? <laughs> why, why, what's holding New Orleans back? What is, what's the problem? And now that like, we, have a, we have, like you said, a, a real demonstrable answer to that question. It's like, no, we do work together. We do have studios. We do have the ability to put out a cohesive project and you know, do the contracts ourselves and get it distributed and all of that. So like, it's, 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 time, to stop it's time to stop talking about the problems and you know, more so about the solutions. And that's what we did, was create the solutions, as you know. It's, it's demonstrable, and you can see it. And so how do we make these solutions sustainable and naturally reoccurring for future musicians? Honestly, I feel like that's happening right now. Like, after Facts. we put out the project, like, I've seen different collectives in the city, like, do similar things. Like, Free Water has a project that's coming out. Jet Life just dropped a, a project with, like, a lot of unknown rappers from the city and things like that. And, like, I, we're getting back into that spirit of, like, not just collaboration, but intentional collaboration. Because that was the difference between global warming, like the entity, and just us being homies before. Because we all knew each other, we all hung out, we all collaborated, we all made music together. But somewhere along the line, right, really right before the pandemic, I, I think at the party session, it became very intentional. And that spirit of intentional collaboration, meaning like, you know, we're all going to do this and we're going to put out a tape. Like that was on our minds. We said it from the very beginning. It took a little bit longer than we wanted to because you know, pandemic and all of that, but that was on our minds. It was intentional. It wasn't just, oh, let's go make some music and maybe you take this one, maybe I'll take that one. No, we're all gonna do it together under one name. So I think that's, 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 that's starting to happen now. So what do you credit to then? Because think about all of the millions of conversations that have happened in studios, in music, throughout the history of time that are about, yo, we gotta work together, let's do this, let's do that, and none of it happens, right? So what, what's different? 
that we did it. <laughs> but okay. The ability to put yourself around certain types of opportunities, you have a greater chance of doing that in different places. Like facts, that's just how it is. It's like if you're trying to find crawfish, you probably don't want to go to Colorado. You're not gonna, you know, have great luck with that. If you want to make and create beautiful, genuine music, that's one thing. But will it be able to be sustained by the city on an infrastructure level? Uh, how many of these songs hit the radio? Like, so if we're talking about like what we're, what we're having to do is create more opportunities because we don't have any. So it's like, yeah, the song was at the Saints game before I hit the radio. The song was at the Pelicans game before I hit the radio. Um, we've done more major interviews than we've done local interviews. Like, so where are we supposed to go? Where are we supposed to take this, this work once we cook it? Like, we gotta take it out of town because it doesn't seem to be worth what it's supposed to be worth when we do it here. So until I feel like the city decides that it's, it loves its hip hop the same way it loves its jazz, like we don't have many options. We gotta create My man. the things for we building the walls and we're inviting people into the building. If you make music and you, you know, you wanna see this thing become great, then, you know, join up, squad up. We know what we're doing. But trying to keep up with the idea of what being on and big and a successful artist in New Orleans could be, may be sustainable to people who are making super relevant music in New Orleans almost 20 years ago. But they're not calling us to do stuff. You know, they're not calling us to do that. So we have to do it ourselves. Does anybody have anything to chime in with that point? No, I mean, I was just gonna add that, I mean, I think just to his point. I mean, I just think that that just and that just speaks to the resiliency of you know just musicians in general, but also musicians from New Orleans. We've always had these different barriers and things that we had to like cross to get our word out. But uh, again, I think it just really, like the young people say, like it really hits different when like we start getting the opportunities to travel and go to other places and live in other places, and you see how the art, you know, is respected and you see how the commerce is flowing and, you know, just, just how appreciation levels are different. And so, you know, again, we know that we have to put in work for stuff to get like that. It's not something that, you know, just happens overnight. But yeah, I mean, you know, we create our own opportunities, but to, to your point and what you asked, I think that there just has to be more intentional funding, more intentional programming. Um, programs like Upbeat, you know what I'm saying, and the amazing stuff that they do, like there needs to be more intentional funds and more funds that go into that to like replicate those kind of things. Roots of Music, there's all different kinds of super dope like music programs here for youth. Noka, I was a part of that for a little bit when I was younger, like talented in the arts, but you know, I really feel like we really have to hone in and be intentional about funding and supporting those kind of entities, because that's where it starts. Like that's, that's where so I got introduced to music, you know, when I was at Lusher. Then I went from Lusher to St. Aug and I played in a band at St. Aug, so I learned about musicality. But when I moved to Nashville, like I said, is when I started to have an interest in music business. But it's only because I had the privilege of being able to, you know, go there and have a scholarship to go to school and learn that stuff. And so, you know, I really think that it's just, we have to be intentional. And there's been a lot of gatekeeping historically in New Orleans with a lot of stuff beyond music. And so it's just, we're in a very, I think, unique time in a lot of different ways. But one of which, when I, which I'm encouraged about, is that a lot of the, you know, uh, I hate to say the urban music, but a lot of the black influencers in music in New Orleans, I would say, are, you know, connected and are on the same page more than most people have been in the past in a long time. So I just think, again, stuff like this is really just to try to push that forward and show folks it can be done. I don't even know if like most of them know that you were asking about like tangible stuff, but shout out to Reed Wick with the Recording Academy. I don't even know if they know this because this just happened yesterday, but starting tomorrow, like Global Warming, the album has made it to the final ballot of Grammy voting for like best album. Yeah, so, dig. Like, Let's go. So like, Let's like, go. Surprise. 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 Yeah. Surprise. 
Yes. And then Pell has like Pell has like three other ones yeah. with his joints that are on that as well. So like again, like just showing people like you can yeah. like you can click up with your people and do this. And like yeah. just to even have our name as a part of the thousands that are gonna be on it, like that's a step within itself. Just showing people it can happen. Like I think that's a step within itself. So again, I mean I think it's it's just we have to support that. We have to get the powers that be to tap into it and support that in any kind of way. And if they don't, then we just gonna keep doing what we're doing and keep making a way and creating a way and trying to pull up and big up the next generation. Cause that's another thing too, these kids are talented. Like, you know, we, I'm, like I said, I'm 37. I'm not giving away these young men's ages, but you know, none of us are teenagers. <laughs> Whoa. You know what I'm saying? None of us are teenagers, but you know, shout out to a million roses, which is a media outlet here Brother Malcolm, his team that's doing some amazing things and they spotlight specifically the young hip hop of New Orleans here. And those, these youngsters are cold. So these youngsters out here, upbeat, like, you know what I'm saying? Like Literally. extra, some of these kids, I know they are like next level. I'm jealous I was not taking my art this serious when I was your age, cold, <laughs> like. So like, we just, we just gotta empower them. I had a big homie that grabbed me and told me, do this. And so like, I'm just trying to pass it on. And, you know, kind of do the exact same thing. But yeah, stuff can be done. We can get to Grammy nominations and do all these other kind of different things that we think are obtainable, but we just gotta do it. Once we do it, then the next person will see it can be done and snowball that thing. We like snowballs. Yeah. We want to snowball the idea. It's bigger and bigger. You're right, you're right. It's, um, it's about us loving ourselves enough to do it for ourselves. And it's also about the city and, you know, like Nate said, the powers that be catching on and supporting and like it's it's happened in tangible ways like i've seen i mean i know we at jazz fest right now so i'm not gonna name no nobody else's festival but i've seen other festivals you know give different hip-hop outlets a chance to run a stage you know and put young hip-hop acts on stage and you know these big you know 25 30 000 people festivals and things like that so if we can get things like that you know and, and keep those going you know maybe a hip-hop 10 at jazz fest Maybe, Ooh. possibly, Ooh. perhaps. Let's go. I, I would really appreciate that. But um, it's been a, it's been who's a, watching out there? It'll be a I fair. I didn't hear anybody say no. <laughs> who's watching out there? It's a fair exchange that. considering they drop back right. that thing up. I, I ain't trying to get nobody in trouble. But I'm just saying I, I wanted that since I was 10 years old. <laughs> but Real. go ahead, man. That would be great. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the recording process. I want to hear a little bit about maybe each one of you can share your favorite, if you can think of one um, collaborative moment where maybe some artists work together that you didn't think would work together or something along those lines where you were like, yo, this is some crazy energy that we're creating that's not going to be able to be replicated just because we're collaborating in this unique way. Uh, I recorded Take Time in my kitchen, but that's not the one I'm excited about. <laughs> I recorded Really Really in my kitchen, fresh off a workout. Like, I wrote it while I was running. I did some push-ups, I came home, I didn't shower or anything, didn't change, I was in my kitchen and recorded that verse, that was tight. And they reconstructed the beat on What Is Love. That was an amazing experience to see happen. Because the original beat for it was crazy. And then Forty went back in and he, he did his thing. Chad went back in, he did his thing, and it was <laughs> The rebrand. Uh, yeah, it used to go by another name. So, forty. If you if you call me that, that's just me in a former life. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but what is love? The story about that. I feel like that session was cool because it was like one day it was like me, Pell, Gazi. It was after going out. We went out. Yeah, there. I think we had yeah. gone out, came back. Me, I think me and Gazi had like made an idea of a beat earlier, and then Pell came in. Was, Yo, I'm recording on this. <laughs> Load it up, load, load it, it up, up, load, load it, it up. up. So yeah, we just spent like all night tracking it. And I ended up actually losing the original files. Ooh. Like I, I think I deleted them on, like they was on my desktop and I moved it into the wrong thing, deleted it. And I was like, all right, well, how am I gonna tell this man that I lost It was file? for the best, it was for the best though. It, it was, was definitely for the I'm best. Fire. I, right, <laughs> <laughs> that was my thought. Uh, but I think a couple months later, I was like, you know what? I just gotta tell this man. He asked for them files. <laughs> Said a couple months. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, so I, you know, told him, broke the news. He's like, it's all right, man. I'm gonna just retract. Gets it back to me same night, and I was like, okay, cool. So that was a huge weight off my shoulders. Don't procrastinate. Do not procrastinate. Do not procrastinate. Just procrastinate. Tell it like it engineer. is, and just deal with it from there. Command S. Right, and save and back up your files. Um, but. 
from there, I got back the files, put it in my Pro Tools session, and I was gonna start engineering the song that night. Uh, and I just hated the drums, like hated the drums. Like, and it just, the, the drums, were, it was a cool pattern, but I just didn't feel like it had enough groove because Jelly had her vocals on there and the Super Soulful Pals performance was Super Soulful. And I was like, we just need more like vibe in these drums. So I just chopped up a drum break, gave it, you know, did my thing to it, sauced it up and then sent, I guess the team, team the song back. Didn't tell anybody I was changing the drums. And people were like, yo, what, what? What's this, a new version? So I think that's, that's like one of my favorite parts. And then crucial recording in his kitchen. Because, you know, if you ever record in the kitchen, kitchen it's like all tile. <laughs> Don't. Worst right? Possible it's like, it sounds like you recorded in the kitchen. So I had to make it not sound like that. So, yeah. Man, that's too funny. I, I love that. Um, especially especially uh, what is love. Because I feel like that, the timing of when you actually had to recreate the the beat for it, my hard drive had actually crashed too. Nice. Upon which I had a lot of the songs stored, like all the stems and everything. So that was just a, a hard time at Global Warming Headquarters that nobody knew about. <laughs> dark day. <laughs> During a panic. Really dark, dark Not going to get it back. Really dark day. <laughs> yeah, like really dark day here. Um, but it, it was, it, was um, it, it came out the way it should. Um, I'm, I love that session. I really love the Hi When I'm Around You session because that was actually my first time um, linking with Iceberg in the studio. And the idea of having Daylight, a uh, consistent collaborator of Chad's and uh, Dominic, who's worked with all of us um, in the studio as well on the singing side, like that juxtaposition. Like, first of all, nobody's ever going to think Iceberg and Pell going to do a <laughs> record, right? So that alone is crazy. Conceptually to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is dope. Um, and also getting to meet him and like see how much he cares about his family and see like actually get to know the man behind the videos I had seen and everything. I really have nothing but respect for him. He's incredible. Um, and I don't think I would have gotten that had I been in a session with him. Um, so that session was very, very uh, uh, motivating for real for me. And also we've become friends because of it. So that would be one of them. And then the second, I think for me, is uh, party, cause party, gosh, that was a party. That was fun. Yeah. That was really fun. Uh, that <laughs> Golly. Um, that was like, I feel like one of the first sessions when we knew that it was actually gonna be a record um, that everybody was gonna be present for. You know, talking about collaboration, especially from like near and far and sending files and all of that was always how it was until that party session. I think party made everybody's mental go, oh, we all can physically link up. It's not as distant as we make it seem, you know what I mean? And like we all said, everybody collaborates all the time, but sometimes you get in your own bubble. As, like it's, it's a small city, but still you can get in your own bubble and not work with people outside of your neighborhood. And I think that, um, because of the variety of people and types of artists that were on that record, like Crew, Sleaze, Kenneth Brother, myself, Trey Prounds and Malik making the beat, it, it, it's so diverse and it just, it's a great showcasing of the diversity of the project. And for us to all see that in real time and like before that session, 504 laid, laid my yeah. verse to finish it. Um, like so much was happening in the energy around that session and we had played Kenneth Brother some records um, and he was like, man, this is what y'all doing? Like, <laughs> like, for real, like, cause, uh, you know, and that was also another sign of like people getting in their own bubbles and we have our own network and, you know, extending um, on both sides, you know what I mean? That invitation to like collaborate further than the studio. So that was a very, very, very uh, big session in, in my book. Um, those two are probably my favorite, yeah. Um, just a quick anecdote about the little iceberg thing. Um, one of my favorite collaborations um, that involves me is that you you called one time and Lil Iceberg needed some help with some publicity oh, wow. or something. Yeah. And because of that conversation, I got my favorite text message that I've ever gotten, which I still want to frame. It says, Wazam, my name Lil Iceberg. <laughs> and it's like one of my favorite text messages ever, That's and that so wouldn't cool. have happened. I remember that. Oh, it was great. <laughs> That's I how love he starts that. his verses, too. That's <laughs> great. That's a um, uh, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. If we got to go favorite studio sessions, um, I wasn't there for the party session, but I, I really considered party like the beginning of like the intentional part of the collaboration process because I was in LA 
And like, Pell called me the next day and was like, bro, we, we made this song last night. It's me and Kenny Brother and Sleazy. And I'm like, first of all, you and KB, y'all do y'all know each other? Like, so, so that was that was my favorite I wasn't there for. But I wanna, did we make High When I'm Around You and N95 at the same time? Is that the same day? Separate days. Two separate, all right, yeah. Cause I know yeah. we made them both at Nate's studio. I, my favorite was probably N95. Cause we had, I want to say it was like nine of us in there. It was a lot of us in there that day. And one of my producers, Audio Hitters, it was his first day like coming around the rest of the crew. And he didn't even, like, he didn't know anybody in the room. So he was just looking around like, wait, they got cats making like different type of music. And you know, the, so it was, that, that was my favorite. I, I got to give it to him. What about you, Nate? Um, probably I was not there for the session, but me and Pell kind of strategically, uh, kind of A&R put together Technicolor, which is Latranium and Dominic Scott. Latranium is a dynamic pop artist from down here that's doing some really dope things. Dominic Scott, like they mentioned, is a phenomenal, just creative beyond the songwriter and the R&B artist. And so I, with this being such a R and with such a hip hop heavy album, you know, I wanted to be more than hip hop. You know, uh, Jelly is singing on uh, "What Is Love," so there is some R and B. But I, I, I wanted it to be. I wanted to show, you know, all these different new sides and new kind of faces that are sprouting from you. And so to have kind of one of the budding R&B artists and Dominic Scott and another pop to kind of come together on a track that I believe Pell produced that, right? That's, that's, a, that's a Pell track. So again, going around to like the artists producing and engineering and like doing all these different kind of things, having their different hands on it. But yeah, that was one of my favorite ones just because that was kind of one of the ones I was like, man, I wonder what it would sound like and it came together and like turned into that. That is kind of like the people's choice after 504. Yeah, that, that's that's the one we didn't expect to yeah. kind of We need a video pop. for that. We knew the 504 was going to hit, but Technicolor we didn't expect and people are drawn to yeah. that. And so that's kind of one of my favorite ones is getting the intro. And through that, people have been introduced to Latranium, I think more than what they would have been introduced to Dominic, who just put a video out. And so I think like that, that helped to kind of, you know, do exactly what we're talking about, be intentional and help to kind of be like, a slingshot of sorts. Now that you've been on this project that's got some traction and you got a calling card, use that and do what you will. You know, like and shout out no to path. you for that too, because he put the training up on my radar. Because yeah, before yeah. it was just for Dom, like uh, yeah, technically. That was cool. That was um, a great idea. I love that song. Yeah. That might be my favorite on there. Well, the other one I can't, is not family friendly. Which one? Really, really. <laughs> <laughs> you know that that I still think that is my favorite beat I've ever made Yo, it's in so my fun. life. It's so much fun. It's like the best. Um, I want to talk a little bit about you specifically because um, you are to me so emblematic of the idea of like you were touching on before about reaching out and being outside your bubble. You've collaborated with artists who are in not just a different genre but like a different universe. Some would say from like you know a traditional hip hop artist like Big Gigantic. Um, and other artists, can you just run through some of the, the names of groups that you've, or musicians that you've collaborated with that people might say are not, wh what people might not expect? Yeah, I think that's always crazy because in terms of like the people that I have collaborated with, I think most of them may be big names in their genre and in their respective fields, but I'll come back and tell my homies like, yo, I got a song with <laughs> Big Gigantic, and they'll look at me like, eh, who is that? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then, you know, I'll do the same thing with Nightmare and, um, uh, great Good Fine Okay, Young Franco most recently in terms of um, how it catapulted into two Apple commercials and like also just like now I have fam in Australia that I never would have had. I think like I've always been about collaboration first and that being the, the, the driving force in why I create every day. I think I, I, once I found my voice and once I found what I start kind of liked to do and I still challenge myself every day but um, what I know I'm good at, you know what I mean? But it's funny because um, my brother would always tell me, he'd always be like, you know, don't, don't do what you're passionate about, do what you're good at. And like, you know, <laughs> and I think that that's, those are words to live by in anywhere outside of the studio, you know what I mean? If you're passionate, if you're listening to something and you're like really inspired by it, try it out or like make sure that you incorporate that the next time you get into that collaborative space because then you don't know what type of doors will open for you and I think that in those spaces these doors have opened for me you know and I think um, Dave Siddick is another example of that TV on the radio one of my favorite bands growing up I listened to a lot of rock music starting but you know 
I didn't want to play guitar. I wanted to rap. You know what I mean? Preservation Jazz Hall. Preservation yeah, Jazz right, Hall. Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned Dave Siddick just because Queso is the gift that keeps on giving and going back to the sync mm -hmm. conversation. Um, Brash. But Brash Tracks, uh, PJ Morton, Casey Hill, uh, Tank and the Bangers. Um, who, uh, <laughs> wait, who else? Who, who else am I not thinking of? Saba, G Easy. Oh, yeah, 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 sure, sure. sure. Uh, G Shout out to Saba, incredible producer, artist. G put me Denzel, on. Denzel, yeah, right. Hello, Denzel Curry. Denzel Curry. Oh, Denzel Curry. Jesus, my bad. Yeah, <laughs> Denzel Curry. Um, just the list goes on, and I think all of these were really possible just because, one, um, you know, I'm musically curious, but two, I think that it, once, you, once you start, you can't stop when it comes to that collab collaborative force. Um, and I think we've even noticed that within global warming, everybody's starting to reach out, get more features, do be, be a feature for somebody that you may not know what type of music they make, but if you press play and it's something that speaks and resonates with you, you don't know what type of doors that can open for you. Um, and I think actually most recently for me, that happened with, I worked with uh, PJ Morton and um, Akil Henry and Itai Shapira on a record on my last project called So Cold. And the producer, Akil, introduced me to this artist named Looney, who is one of the best vocalists I've heard um, out of Canada. And I, it opened up a whole new Canadian fan base to my music that now people want me to tour in Canada. People want me to go everywhere in Canada. Because I didn't just say, well, well, this is somebody that I listened to when I was in college, or this is somebody that you know I think is my peer, so I need to make music with them. It's like, no, what else can I do outside of my, my view and outside of my you know, um, my repertoire. So I think that that's why I'm, I'm very hands-on with that collaborative force. And it, it shows in the project too, like he said, all the R&B, the that Technicolor, I was listening to a lot of Snow Allegra. I really wanted to work with Snow Allegra. I was like, if I were to make a beat for Snow Allegra, what would it sound like? And then, you know, um, it's it, it, it's better in my opinion. I, I'm glad Dom, <laughs> no no shade, but hey, I'm glad Dom and Latrania blessed that. Shout out to True True Brand, um, yeah. And crucial, can you talk a little bit about uh, collaboration in your career and and a role that maybe that it's played for you in your in your solo stuff? Uh, what collaboration? Mm -hmm. I feel like that I've put out a lot more collaborative projects recently than I have for myself. One of the most recent one was a song I made called Home Slice with this chef from uh from he was born in New York but moved here but he hit, he his media company hit me up and were like hey we're looking for new artists and things to collaborate and make content with we made a song called Home Slice about eating pizza and then I went to <laughs> New York maybe 2 weeks ago and I stayed out there at his crib for a week and we we did a video release party at the Essex Market in uh Brooklyn I think and then we went on a pizza tour and I eat pizza at like <laughs> 12 pizza places for like a week. And I didn't lose my figure. <laughs> Shout out to God. But um, yeah, the collaboration in that expanded my music into, uh, like he said, a whole different group of people. Uh, Jenna Fisher, who played mm. Pam on The <laughs> Office, she commented on the video and was like, this is amazing. I couldn't have sent that woman a song before that. Like, I wouldn't have thought about I wouldn't even thought about doing it. But she's an avid baker, apparently, <laughs> as a hobby. And she's a big fan of, of Art Artisan Brian, and he makes bread. So now that we have music together, and it's something that his people can digest, and my fans already know that, you know, this is, this is who I am and what I do. So it's opened a whole lot more opportunities, doors. Uh, Collaborating with Chad. Chad and I have a, a project called More Love. We got a placement this year for one of the one of the last editions that we put on the tape for a song called Progress. We got that placed on uh, this PBS documentary about taking down the Confederate monuments and everything. And that was my first placement. I ain't, I ain't, <laughs> that was That's a pretty good one. Exactly. You know what I mean? So pretty good one. these collaborations are are letting us see a whole lot more things that are are possible. But honestly, when I came into the more serious part of my career, I was still making music and working with Pell. But Pell had already put me around major opportunities to see different kind of collaborations. I think one of the first things we did was a Samsung commercial. And they ended up playing that during the finals. So everybody ate off that. It was, it's, it, that's when, when I saw that, I was I like, I forgot okay. that one, my bad. Yeah, that's, <laughs> me, that's yeah, the real. That's that OK. 
that, yeah, that's different. It's life changing, and it's it's available when you put yourself in the path of opportunity. You allow yourself to network and work with different people. Like you get to do and see a whole lot more. Well, Nate, um, I would be remiss not to bring up your extensive work as an advocate. Can you tell folks who are here and who are watching a little bit about the work that you're doing, um, not just with global warming, but the stuff you've got, your recent developments with MACNO, and maybe some of them people stuff and Tank and the Bangas, and how all of that coalesces into your, your mission as an advocate for musicians? I think at the, at the core of it all is just allowing people chances to do what these cats did and just show themselves and share their voice. And so like, so sitting on the board at MACNO, a lot of the work that we're doing now is, you know, in response to the hurricane, you know, raising funds for artists directly, like low barrier funds. Because what I think a lot of people don't realize is that when all these different things happen and, you know, people say, oh, you know, this big superstar, this big company donated X amount of money to the city of New Orleans, right? And it's beautiful. Everything's fixed, right? Everything's all good. Brad Pitt and, you know, all these folks gave millions of dollars, right? And so, but, you know, there often are so many systematic barriers before that money even trickles down to the people that need it. And so I think that, you know, at Magna, we were very intentional about having low barrier grants. And so just being very intentional about trying to get money directly to the people that need it. You know, we are aware that everybody, most people here that need it in New Orleans specifically, you know, in the artists and cultural area community, they may not have an internet connection. So sending out a Google form and saying, well, we sent the form out, you know, you should just do it. That's, it's not that easy, right? Everybody may not have Wi-Fi or access to it. You know, let's be real. We're, we're in an educational system that is, that is, you know, not, the best, and so some of us are privileged to have gone to schools that have helped us to get to that, but we also have to you know, be empathetic and real with ourselves that we have a lot of folks that are not at that point and we have to show them and tell them and kind of slow down, and I think sometimes we lose patience with trying to help some of our younger folks and some of our folks who we don't feel are on the same educational level or social economical level, like I think that's just, that's a barrier within itself. And so like kind of humbling ourselves and being willing to help somebody. And like Juan said during our process, be real intentional. If somebody didn't know a word on a contract, it's a judgment free, we were very intentional about being judgment free. Look, if you don't want to say it in front of the group that you don't know what this binding agreement means or you don't know what this license thing, text me on the side, like text me on the side, I don't know what this means and I'll explain to you later, but like just trying to be transparent and like just create this culture of like everybody just being able to obtain knowledge and knowledge being accessible. So like that's just where it sits with that. And so there's a lot of other different work that we'll do there with them people productions that I have with my wife Crystal, like it's really just about highlighting, same thing in alignment with Global Warming, highlighting artists here in New Orleans that are phenomenal artists, artists that have art that is, can transcend the times, but there's, you know, there's a disconnect between, you know, business infrastructure and reaching that next level. And so just trying to help them in all different kind of ways, offering workshops and just offering ways for, like I say, for us to just be ourselves. You know, the story with Tank and the Bangers that a lot of people don't know, like when we first started was that, you know, there was a black owned bookstore, you know, uh, by my brother by kid that was called Black Star on the West Bank. He gave us the keys to that bookstore and was like, whenever y'all need to practice, whenever y'all need to, you know, get together, here's your spot, here's a PA, here's some drums, here's some keys. This is the same brother who also was a real big mentor to um, Alfred Banks also and kind of encouraged him. He was Alfred Banks' high school teacher at Carr and encouraged him to have a career and his career skyrocketed. So having somebody like that to give us that space and just to believe in us and we got to try things and do events and we didn't have to worry about like, okay, this is, you know, someplace that we have to pay for. Like that pressure was off that we can try to experiment and do these weird different kind of things and build our community. Like that's, that's really at the core of it. It's like everything I'm doing is just really trying to, you know, show, you know, the powers that be and people that want to invest into the city that these safe spaces, you know, particularly for young POC, native folks in the city are diminishing and those are the things that make the city special. You know what I'm saying? We, places like Preservation Hall and all these other, Congo Square, we have places that are like known throughout the world as these dynamic music making creative hubs and so we have to protect that and the only place we're gonna have more of those is 
by encouraging the young folks that's creating it and making it and doing it. So yeah, that's like, it's a lot of stuff that my hand is on, but at the core of it, like that's what it is. Like I have an eight year old son. I want my son to be able to make music. I've got friends out here who have kids on the way and days and like we talk about, you know, our, the next generation is bigger than us now. You know what I'm saying? I've gotten to the age where it's like, it's bigger than me. It's bigger than like what I see in front of me. Like what, what are my kids gonna have? What are these young folks who are talented? Like what are they gonna have beyond when I'm out of this thing, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really just about accessibility. You know what I'm saying? It's about just letting these young folks and these young creators be heard and like just education. Cause like Juan said earlier, the more you know, the less you can hopefully get screwed over. <laughs> yes. Do any of you have any um, thoughts about where collaboration stands today in New Orleans music uh, and how it contrasts to when you were younger? Uh, well, I guess in terms of how it, how it like correlates to what it was like when we were younger, I feel. I feel as though we definitely saw rap crews and we definitely saw labels, you know, and um, in the city working to get their name out there and like, but we're still doing stuff in the city as well. I think um, we are a part of that lineage in a way, you know what I mean? I think what's going on right now, while it may not be us reinventing the wheel, I think we're just, you know, improving the function. I think like right now we are definitely uh, learning from the, those eras and most notably even recent, still I think Jet Life having a presence here and you know what I mean being in the city having a space here is very important and it shows like you were talking about um, what's the demonstrative uh, benefit of us putting out this project it's that we can do these things while still being here so I think that there's a lot of collaboration going on right now and a lot of people willing to it, in a very important time, especially like right after Ida you know what I mean and other things where you know some of our members are in LA right now and are flying back and uh, you know everybody's figuring out where where is the right place to be. I think it's important that we have um, structures and, and infrastructure here right now, and I think that there's several other crews that are doing it as well. Um, it's, it's it's working. And I mean, I guess as a what when we were I guess younger, I d I, it's like I guess we're all still young, so we haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> what this is gonna look like in you know Spend ten years, so. like <laughs> as the wow. nah nah we all still young. So like in ten years, what is it gonna look like? That's I feel like that's a better time to ask that because what we're eight months, ten months, well yeah, eight months out, nine months out from releasing the project. This is still still fresh, super fresh. But yeah, I mean, still rap crews. Still there's still a bunch of rap crews in the city. It's just it's evolved and grown, you know. So. So what are the, the plans for next steps as a, as a crew, as a collective? Is there a volume two coming? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be really well, weird for you guys to call it volume one and then not have any other <laughs> Volume one and a half dropping soon. Yeah, we, um, yeah, did we spoil it 1. by 5. calling it volume one? I don't know. We don't know what the future holds, but definitely it's going to be something that's yeah. beneficial to the community like Nate was talking about, like Juan was talking about, and something that we can be proud of. Um, I think most importantly is the education that they were talking about, and then through that, creating more projects that make sense for us to showcase to the world. I mean, I'm currently working on at least four EPs or albums, you know, with mostly with all you know global warming artists. Uh, so, I mean, is that in the lineage? Yes, but you know, when on paper we'll look at that in the future. But yeah, there's always we're always working on stuff. So. I think the way we put the, the last one, the first one together, since it was, you know, the first trial that we, we made, we did it a certain way. So if we do go back to rethink about a, a grand collaborative project, it'll be way more intentional when we go about it. So it'll, we'll definitely continue to work together and build Global Woman into a, a collective and a team that can represent what the future of New Orleans music can be, you know. But as far as calling it a volume two, until we say it's volume two, <laughs> yeah. And these cats be busy. These cats be busy. See, what they didn't say too is this was also made easier because we was in a pandemic. Mm. These cats be all yep. over the place. So when everybody was sitting at home, it was kind of- had to stay here. Yeah, <laughs> it was easier for Crucial to get that, that, that verse right back because wasn't nobody doing nothing. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, but, uh, but uh, yeah, so yeah, we it, it'll, it'll definitely be more stuff. But pre folks are getting busy, and it did exactly what we wanted it to do. It got folks buzzing, it got folks moving, yeah. it got folks recognized and creative and outside of their bubble. So yeah, there'll be there'll be some stuff coming because we gotta highlight uh gotta highlight our women. I think we got some dope yeah. New Orleans women. Yep, we yep. want to be more intentional about that. So like we 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 get more intentional about that. But uh yeah, it's, it's all kind of stuff coming. Yeah, it's uh it, it, I feel like the project put a good battery in like everybody's mm -hmm. back because that's a good way to put everybody's it. busy. Like Pell just dropped an album. Chad's working on a bunch of stuff. Crucial's dropped what two projects since and the Home Slice drum, like because you got this the project with Sozi and oh, yeah. and uh, yeah. the drum with Chad. Like yeah. uh, I'm working on a, a poetry album and a kind of like modern country album with this Ooh. different, like we all have stuff going on. I feel like that's really like the big lineage of it. Like not just coming back together to do another tape, but the fact that all of us are taking our stuff so much more seriously now. And like Dominic's putting out stuff, the train names is put like, I feel like everybody that's on a tape has put out maybe a whole project, if not multiple songs. Eddie. Since then. Yeah, we got Sleazy on the Everybody. way. Everybody. Sleaze. We got Sleaze, Sleaze coming. People putting out video. Crazy visuals. Dominic is shooting everybody's stuff. <laughs> 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 but so, um, yeah, we, uh, we're just working. That's, that's the legacy is just get to work. Oh, yeah, Dominic got that seven shooter placement. Yeah. Yeah, Dominic. Yeah. And Chad. Chad got some writing credit. Yeah. 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 And Chad. Yeah. And Chad. Songwriter. So, so what, if, what advice do you have for kids or for younger artists who might want to um, be more experimental or maybe put themselves out there a little bit more to be more collaborative? Where would you tell them to look towards in order to, to kind of activate that part of their creative process? Listen to everything. Like, there's no such thing, no genre is inherently bad. Like, if you're like, oh man, I hate country. Like, I mean, there's some bad country songs, but there's good country out there. There's some good country out there. I mean, that's just a fact. Like, don't, don't limit yourself in what you listen to, what you, you know, intake. Because as soon as you do that, like, you're like super limiting on what your potential could be. Yeah. Like, li listen to everything and absorb yeah. it. Like, don't. Don't belittle somebody's work because you don't get it. Just try to see what their perspective is, learn from it, and take from it. You know, take what works. Because there's always something in there that works. So, yeah. Definitely. Uh, I think you just have to look within your community and look at what opportunities are right in front of you. Because a lot of times there's low-hanging fruit. Like, I think oftentimes even we talk about, like, being well-traveled or, like, going here and there and all of us being booked and busy, but a lot of the things that are most <laughs> meaningful and some things that are very transformative in my career have been, you know, the things that I've done with people on this stage, not just global warming. And I think oftentimes we do think about, well, we're not getting this support from home. You know, we need this big, big investor to do this to, so I, cause I want to be Drake or like something like that, you know, or I want to be Cole or something like that. And a lot of times it's those little relationship, the, the little like, the little conversations that you have with people that let them know what you're doing and allow them to be invest in what you're doing. And I, I think that that's um, one of the most beneficial things about New Orleans. People like to go out. People like to go hang out, see, you know, if it, go to the club. I don't go to the club, you know. What I mean? <laughs> but like, you go do whatever you want. And I think there's a lot of people that are out in the streets. And especially since we're at a more relaxed time, um, it, you're, it's possible for you to create those um, relationships because it, real life is everything the internet isn't and you can get wrapped into you know getting on Instagram getting on Twitter getting on these social media platforms and putting your stuff out there and then never talking to the person that you go to school with or the person that's like all literal. social I mean all media no social all media no social <laughs> I know right <laughs> but like I, I think that that's the that's the thing that we have to overcome especially when you're an independent artist I think a lot of my success came from doing shows Nesby Phipps told me um, that like one of my mentors, he told me when I first started, make sure you do shows within a 300 mile radius to 500 mile radius of where you live so that people know what you're doing because it's, it's impossible to fight through the traffic, you know what I mean? Unless you got something that's made for TikTok. You know, we talking about radio, we talking about all these other things. People don't even pay attention to, to that, you know what I mean? You have to create a community for what you're trying to put out in the world before you can even think about these things as feasible options. 
So it's like start start small first and start local. And that's something that we've done with this project. Sure, we were able to connect the dots with some bigger things, like shout out to In Grooves um, and leveraging projects, you know what I mean? And that's Distro that helped us with certain things that we were able to do. But I think everything is, um, it is imperative to the community when you speak to the community about it. So. Yeah, um, the first thing I would say is don't be scared. You gotta get that fear out your heart. If you're gonna be an artist and you, you're gonna have to be vulnerable. Like your art is always gonna be an expression of your inner self and it's gonna be difficult to put that out there, but you're gonna have to get past that. And number two, um, it's basically exactly what Pell said, like look around you. Like it's, it's remarkable the things that you'll be able to do with people that you already know. I mean, I, I know that we're in the 21st century and like people meet through the internet and a lot of great things have happened because people are able to meet through the internet and collaborate that way. But I've known Pell since I was six years old. I've known Chad since I was, 12 or 13 years old. His older brother is my best friend. I met Crucial through Pell, and we've become very close. As soon as Chad moved back home, I introduced Chad to Crucial, and that's why he bought the studio. And that, like, you just have to, you can create your own environment with who you know, you know? So don't, don't get so caught up in, the, oh, I gotta meet somebody on the internet. Oh, I can, I can cold call, I can cold email. You can do all of that. But your best collaborator might be the cat that you've known since middle school. So let's just take that. That was good. <laughs> Damn, I like that. Nah, um, nah, for real. But I would say, like, really you snort. Find your inspiration, like whatever that means. Like, and I, you, you, you hear people say that, but like, really and truly, like. I don't think there's a template for that because each artist, each person is different. Like some people's inspiration is external, right? I have to find my tribe. Like that's what encourages me to do it if I'm around other people doing it, right? Some people, I need to go into like solitude to really like pump this out. Also, we human beings, we're fluid. So you might be all of that. But like, I think really tapping into when it comes to like creating, like tapping into like what is your inspiration like there's a bunch of advice I can give folks but like that's the first thing like that's the first thing especially to my younger folks or folks that are just kind of like getting it rolling like and that's really for anybody but that's the first thing I tell them is like what are you doing this for and like figure it out is it, is it for you is it because you feel this is therapy is this therapeutic you know that's that's a, that's a beautiful thing you know is this is this you know not only for yourself but you're hoping to help someone else you know, like find out what that is because out of that is gonna birth a whole bunch of other different answers that you're gonna need on this path. And it's just kind of like, you know, to use it as a map of source, like that's your, that's kind of like your source, that's your starting point. Whatever your inspiration for creating is, you need to figure out like what that is and just build from there. Everything else, I won't say it'll just come, like there's work, you gotta put it in work, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, what is it that does it? Like, is it like my mom, like is it, your kid, like, is again, just kind of pinpointing and always being aware. It may change, like I said, we're, we're fluid beings, but like always being in tune with like, why am I doing this? Like, is this a creator sent thing so it's spiritual for you? Like, just find out whatever that is and tap directly into that. Because I promise you there will be times where you're gonna be like, man, forget this. <laughs> I am about to use this degree and go get this desk job. <laughs> I'm about to go call up my people friend with this $70,000 job waiting on me in corporate land somewhere. Like, but, and, but it was times that I tapped into like why I was doing it. And because I knew that I wanted to create spaces that allowed for like super dope people like these folks to be able to share their voice. That like, that's what kept me pushing. And so like, yeah, tap into why you're doing it. That's, that's, that's a good start. There's a book called Start With Why. It's pretty, it's pretty good at answering that question. Start um, with why? Start with why, yeah. Figuring out your artistic purpose, looking in with, within yourself to figure out your reasoning behind doing anything because it's easy to get distracted or thinking that you know where your goal is and you're actually shooting at a whole different basket. So the last thing I want to ask you guys, we only have a few minutes left, is uh, besides each other, of course, and this goes for you guys too, even though technically you're not musicians in, that, in this particular project, Dream collaboration. Crucial. Why did I go first? <laughs> you sat on the end. Uh, yeah. Like, like dream, like I'm um, Dream, sl um, it doesn't sleep? even have to be music. It can be anything. What we is talk, your dream We're talking dead or alive, Amanda? Are we talking alive? Like, what, uh, what's the parameter? Dead or alive or, or just alive? 
No parameters. No parameters. No parameters. Oh, no, no, that's no too hard. No parameters. <laughs> one day, one alive. <laughs> Jesus would be cool. Um. <laughs> Jesus is the one. Um. Bob Marley and Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Okay. That, I mean, it's, a, it's my dream. It's a shoot dream. For the stars, so, yeah, yeah, huh? Shoot for the stars. Yeah. Shoot for the stars. Shoot for the stars. Yeah. And Beyonce's in the room, cooking. I don't okay. Know. She's All just right. there. Okay. 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 Hey now. Hey now. Cooking. <laughs> uh, I guess I'd say I don't even need to collab, but a, like a conversation with Pharrell, Ooh. Rick Rubin, Dre. Uh, you know, I throw Khaled in there just as a curveball because he's got a different Isn't he perspective. Is he from Kenner? He's from Kenner. He, or, look, he don't claim it, but he is. That boy from he Kenner. Is. Uh, yeah, I throw Khaled in there. And then Timberland. And I just want to sit down. Sit down with them. Just get, give game. I think conversation's collaboration. Conversation. Well, yeah. Collaboration that would, that would be ideal. I'm going to let y'all talk. Yeah. I'm going to just listen. Yeah. Yeah, no, for real. What about you, pal? Uh, I think for sure Pharrell is one. Um, Bjork Ooh. would be crazy. I think Tom York would be crazy. Ooh. I also think that Stevie Wonder would be Ooh. like, oh, my God, that's <laughs> like. That's probably, that's, that is the top. Um, and they've all inspired me in different ways, so those would probably be, yeah, that would probably be one. Juan? James Brown and Quincy Jones. Okay, all right, I like it. You mean the two of them together or you with them? Um, I, I picked one day, James Brown won a lot, Quincy Jones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they want to give me, Somebody I'm, gonna, I'm not sure. <laughs> That would be a that would be a joint though, right? Yeah, it would be crazy. Right. If they were together, yeah, that's too much. That would be, much. be a joint. <laughs> yeah. Nah, I would probably say uh, just like I said, coming from like the business producer side, I would probably say Clarence Avon and Ooh. Alan Tucson. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like if you don't know who Clarence Avon is, check him out. He has a documentary on Netflix yeah, called The it's Black Godfather. So crazy, right? Super dope. Insane. Story. Super dope. Inspirational yeah. cat who I yeah. draw. Hella inspiration from, but uh, yeah, those two, I think. On awesome. My end. So where can pe folks go to catch up with what global warming's doing? Everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, global warming at global warming uh, is the Instagram at G L B L W R M N G five zero four. Also, I just come holler at us. We'll plug you in. But uh, yeah, globalwarming.com. Um, these artists here are phenomenal social media beings and influencers, and so ah. yeah, tap into their Instagram. Right. I'm under the influence right now. <laughs> we got a, we got a couple of people that write about us sometimes. You know, <laughs> Amanda writes about us sometimes in the paper. You know, Jake clapping them occasionally will be. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Jake. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. It's always a pleasure to be around you guys. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Shout out to Jazz Fest. Shout yeah, out. Jazz yeah. Fest. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. This was an honor. Um, and yeah, if any of you guys have questions for any of these gentlemen, I'm sure they would be happy to answer them after we All get off stage. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Shout out to Amanda. Yeah. <laughs>